Once a diverse and abundant order, the snakeflies thrived in the age of the dinosaurs. Now just a remnant of their former glory, these living fossils are a relic to the past. Welcome to the Insect Spotlight Project, a channel dedicated to shining a light on insects, spiders, and any other creepy crawlies that get left out of the ecologic spotlight. Today we're talking about the order Raphidioptera, better known as the snakeflies. This is the third of three orders within the Neuropterida preceded by the Neuroptera and the Megaloptera. These three groups were once all contained within the Neuroptera, but Raphidioptera and Megaloptera have since been split off into their own orders. Snakeflies may look unassuming at first glance, but do a double take and you'll find that their form is a bit... awkward. The most distinctive characteristic of snakeflies is probably their long neck, and this is really just an extended prothorax. You'll see this lengthy prothorax in things like mantids and mantid flies as well, but snakeflies lack those grasping raptorial arms, so there shouldn't be any trouble differentiating the two. Like the other Neuropterida, Raphidioptera has heavily veined wings, and you should notice a small brown or black patch on the wings. This is called a pterostigma. It's a little bit heavier than the rest of the wing, and it actually helps to create a more efficient wing beat. You'll also see this in things like dragonflies and such. Aside from that, they'll have long antennae, chewing mouth parts, and well-developed compound eyes on a sort of flattened head. The females will also have a prominent ovipositor, which is that long needle-like structure that they use to lay their eggs. This long ovipositor is actually where they get their name. Raphis means needle, and pteron means wing. So Raphidioptera roughly means needle-winged. But the more correct way to interpret this would be winged needles, as needle doesn't describe their wing shape, but rather their elongate body and their long ovipositors. Now you might be wondering where the name snakefly came from. Or maybe you already put it together. The flattened head and the long neck give Raphidiopterans a sort of snake-like appearance. Hence the name snakefly. Snakeflies are incredible insects, but they're not particularly diverse. Well, the living ones, at least. During the age of the dinosaurs, snakeflies were in much larger supply. We found snakefly fossils all over the world, but nowadays they're mostly limited to temperate regions in Europe, Asia, and Western North America. This makes them a relict group, having been more widespread and diverse in the past. It seems their reign ended with the Cretaceous period. I guess the asteroid hit them pretty hard. Snakeflies are also one of our oldest holometabolous insect orders. Holometaboli refers to a complete four-stage metamorphosis, from egg, to larvae, to pupae, to adult. Snakeflies use those long ovipositors we mentioned to lay their eggs deep into bark crevices to protect them from would-be predators. Would be predators. Like, like would be. Like wood from a tree. Once they hatch, these bark crevices become more than just protection. They also become their hunting grounds. Prowling around cracks and grooves in the tree bark, snakefly larvae are voracious predators. They use their flattened bodies to chase down prey even in those hard-to-reach places. There are some groups that will prowl around soil detritus, but the bark crevice thing feels more unique, so let's just keep our focus there for now. They'll feed on whatever they can get their hands on. Aphids, beetle larvae, caterpillars, caterpillar eggs. When the larvae are ready, they'll burrow into the soil or find a bark crevice of their own where they can safely pupate. These pupae are weird. Unlike most pupal stages, which have very limited movement, snakefly pupae can move just fine. If they don't like the nook they've found, they can just move to a different one. It's a little odd. When the adults emerge, they turn over a new leaf. And instead of prowling around for small arthropods to prey on, they take to the air, and they scan the area for small arthropods to prey on. They're predators through and through. And we love them for it. Snakeflies are a welcome guest in orchards and gardens. Aphids are a favorite treat of the snakefly, so we get along with them swimmingly. The larvae can prey on wood-boring insects, and the adults can patrol the foliage. 
they've got both our bases covered. Although apparently the larvae can get a little nippy sometimes, snake flies don't sting and they're not venomous. That long needle is just for laying eggs, I promise. Like we discussed with Megaloptera, Raphidioptera have a very long life cycle spanning multiple years, with most of this time spent in its larval form. And like Megaloptera, this can put it at risk. Raphidioptera already has to worry about hungry birds and parasitic wasps. The last thing it needs to be worrying about is chemical sprays. Spraying down your trees with pesticides may seem like a good idea, but you're taking out the predators that work hard to protect your tree. And they normally don't bounce back as fast as the pests will. There are some cases where treatment is necessary, but if you're planting native trees on your property, for the most part, they can handle themselves. With a little help, of course. Overall, snakeflies are a pretty rare find, and definitely one worth taking a photo of if you come across it. This is the first order we've covered that I personally have never seen face to face, and consequently don't have any photos of. I have to cut myself a little slack though, because I live and grew up on the east coast. The nearest snakefly is like a thousand miles away. But I digress. Thank you all so much for listening, and remember to like and subscribe to keep up to date with future orders. And if you have any favorite species from this group, or any fun Raphidioptera facts I didn't cover, please leave them in the comments below, I would love to hear about them. Peace y'all.